All right, I think uh, I might take this opportunity to revive this YouTube channel. So at the time I'm recording this, hello to all my 22 followers from 10 plus years ago, but uh, I've changed hobbies a little bit. I'm more into drones now than I, I am RC cars, but uh, I just wanted to make this video just to kind of document my experience of taking the FAA Part 107 exam. Currently, I am on my way to the testing center I would say all in all, I probably studied for, I don't know, maybe 15 hours in total. And I didn't pay for any study material. I didn't personally think it was really necessary. I kind of just watched two hour and a half long YouTube videos. I can link those down in the description. Um, just to get an idea, first of all, of what is even on the part 107 exam. And then second of all, uh, to obviously start identifying what isn't common sense and what I'm gonna have to do a deeper dive in. So it's like starting with the overview of those two hour and a half long videos and then dialing it into what I struggled with a little bit. It seemed to be the best approach for me because I know the FAA recommends about, I think 15 to 20 hours of study time. I probably could have gotten away with a little less. I guess the test will kind of be the determinant of that. Uh, I haven't taken it yet, so I don't want to jinx myself, but uh, I feel like I could have been confident with less study time. I'm just typically an over-preparer. But uh, even on the way to the exam right now, I'm in the middle of listening to yet another YouTube video. Uh, just going over test taking tips, looking for any last minute uh, information I can cram into my brain. Uh, yeah, so overall, I mean, I think the METAR, the TAF reports, um, the weather specifically, I feel like is going to be the trickiest thing for me, especially like cold fronts, warm fronts, cloud formations, when to expect fog, different types of fog. Uh, I spent a good amount of time on that last night, actually kind of cramming for this just because that was definitely what I was most uncomfortable with. The regulations kind of make sense when you think about it. Airspace gets a little, a little confusing, especially when you're working with shelves, you're working with airports that kind of overlap each other. But the weather, I'm just hoping they don't have too many questions on fog and weather. I think I could get, I would say, 70 to 80% of them right at this point. But I, I, it's not one of my more comfortable subjects through studying. So I think I'll check in again when I get to the testing station. Because I gave myself about 40 minutes before my actual testing time. Just to, again, get some last minute information in and make sure I can actually find the place. Um, so yeah, I'll see you guys in a second. All right, so I just pulled up. Uh, nerves are definitely kicking in, but uh, overall, I just watched a really helpful video um, on just going over like most missed questions on the exam, or at least for this guy in particular. So I'll definitely post that one down in the description too, because that one was helpful. Uh, he didn't even have all the answers, but I mean, at least just identifying uh, which ones kind of tripped him up. And they were a little tricky. So I think I'm psyching myself out just because I'm watching all the videos that describe the hardest questions are the ones people got wrong. So I think I'm discounting the fact that I'm kind of taking for granted the ones that I'll obviously get right. But uh, yeah, I'm sitting outside. It's a pretty cool. It's a little airport here. Got a bunch of little planes. Uh, it's just funny to me that we have to know so much about uh, actual manned aircrafts and airports and everything like that just to fly a little one and a half pound drone. So... I guess I'll, uh, I'll spend the next uh, about 15 minutes in here. Just check the time. I got about 15 minutes until it's 15 minutes before the exam. So I'll go over a couple more videos, try to figure out uh, any last minute holes I can plug. But yeah, I'll check back in right after. All right. So I just got out of the testing center. I just finished up. I did pass with a 90%. So I'll take it. I was definitely hoping to be above 90. Uh, so I'm satisfied with that. I didn't want to be in the 80s. Really just was a pride kind of thing. Uh, honestly though, it was a little tougher than I expected. All the things I kind of doubled down on in the last couple days just didn't end up even being on the test. Like they had maybe one question on reading a TAF report and it was a little harder than I thought. It was just trying to uh, decipher when scattered clouds are supposed to start. I think I maybe just got a little flustered and uh, just kind of had a little bit of a brain freeze. I got that one, I'm pretty sure, but uh, it took me a second. I had to be super careful, super slow. Um, a lot of referencing the little booklet that they give you when you're in there. So uh, advice, take your time. Definitely take, uh, you know, take the whole time if you don't need it, but 
reference that chart as much as you can just because there is a bunch of hidden answers like built into the chart already, built into the reference book that you don't necessarily have to memorize. Uh, I took note of a couple questions. I ended up flagging about 12 questions at first. And then when I went through them, I got it down to about nine that I wasn't positive about. Uh, the ones that I was the most unsure about, I'll kind of go through them with you guys now. I just uh, wrote some like chicken scratch in a notebook trying to uh, remember before they just escaped my memory. But first one had to deal with center of gravity. So the question was about if you loaded an aircraft to the most aft center of gravity, would it be more stable at slow speeds and less stable at higher speeds or the opposite or just less stable all around? I didn't know at all. I had no idea how the center of gravity played into that one. I think I chose more stable at high speeds, less stable at low speeds. I can't give you a good reason on why I chose it. It just felt right. The next one that kind of stumped me was where to find more information on traffic patterns and some sort of noise ordinances around like your local airport. Uh, there was a couple choices. I, I have two of the choices here. I can't remember what the third one was. Uh, but one of them was the like aeronautical information something. The abbreviation was AIM. The next one was the chart supplements US. In all the practice tests that I took, most of the answers that had to do with finding more information ended up being in the chart supplement. So I just went with that one. Um, I wasn't sure what the AIM was, but I did look in the, the supplement book that they give you and AIM was mentioned in there. So I guess I just missed it in my studying and the practice exams I've taken up until this point. The next one had to do with remote ID and there were like three or four questions on remote ID and none of the review videos that I've watched have really given any and definitely not good remote ID practice questions. So I was trying to read straight from the part 107 laws to kind of get my own information from that but there was something it was either ABS or ADS-B uh, some acronym like that you guys might be familiar with it. But it was asking about what is, uh, is ADS-B, or again, I'm not sure on the acronym, is it sufficient for replacing remote ID? Do you need to have remote ID module on top of it? Um, is it only good in like uh, anything but class B airspace? And I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't that one because uh, you, you definitely need clearance in, in C and D uh, if you're really gonna fly near any airport. So I chose that it was sufficient in, um, I think it was ASD. It was automatic surveillance device broadcasting, something like that. I chose that it was sufficient to replace a remote ID module. And I thought that was the key word that they included the word module in the choice. Um, so I thought maybe the automatic surveillance was the thing built into newer drones already. Like I know DJI, they include like remote ID built in. And I thought maybe that was called uh, automatic surveillance. So I don't know. I might've got that one wrong. I ended up getting six questions wrong on the whole test. So that, that, well, that could have been one of them. The next question was totally stumped me. I had not seen this at all, but when are you required to register or uh, are you allowed to have a foreign registered drone also registered in the United States? The choices were you're not allowed to do that at all, uh, only for recreational purposes or only essentially for commercial purposes where things you're getting paid for. Uh, I chose recreational. I just feel like they'd be more strict on commercial for some reason. Again, it was just trying to find like a common sense answer, like recreational, the the requirements are a little less strict. So I figured I'd go with that one. Uh, lights at night. So night flying is definitely new uh, compared to the test a couple of years ago. But there was a question about uh, if you're gonna be flying in an area with high intensity lights at night, do you want the lights to be on and you wanna make sure they're gonna be on? Do you want them to be off? or should you, should you be flying FPV? And I knew that wasn't it because they want you to have visual line of sight, not just looking through the camera of the drone. Um, I chose that you want the lights off. And I actually changed my answer. I started with that you want the lights on because I just thought, oh, better visibility. But there was a question later about the screen of your controller at night. And it was, do you want it at full brightness for better visibility? Do you want it at minimal brightness? And I just kind of figured at night, you don't want to be staring into a back, a very bright backlit, backlit screen, and then try to look up in the sky and find your drone. Your eyes are going to be all messed up. 
So I figured maybe the same principle kind of applied to um, exterior intense lights. Like maybe you want them off because just overall visibility will be better if you don't have external lights affecting uh, what you can see up in the sky. So I chose to have the lights off. Again, I'm not sure. I did change from having the lights on. So I think I got that right. It's, it makes sense to me, but I'll have to look it up. And if you guys know, just definitely drop it in the comments. Um, when are you required to present your certificate, like your remote pilot certificate, uh, to whom? So the first answer was a community uh, based organizer. Uh, the next one was a TSA rep. And the next one was a representative of the Declaration of Compliance. And I had no idea what that was, so I skipped that one. Uh, I don't remember hearing anything about like a TSA rep in any of the study. I thought I remember hearing like a community-based organizer, um, organization, maybe that was the word. So I chose that one, I wasn't positive. Um, and then the last one was when the FAA requests it, what are you required to provide? And the first one was something stupid. It was like a medical, uh, something medical related in your driver's license. I knew that wasn't it. So it left me with flight logs from the last couple of months or your remote pilot certificate. This one, it to me was almost like a choose the best answer. And although flight logs is really believable, I just feel like it's almost like you get pulled over by a cop in your car you're gonna to have to present your license. So I thought maybe the remote pilot certificate would be the right answer here. Another thing that I thought of that would be really helpful, know your charts. Know the charts really well. I think if there was a type of question that I had the absolute most of in one particular category it was definitely charts. It was identifying obstacles on a chart, knowing whether it was above sea level or above ground level. And then along with that goes knowing the airspaces. So knowing exactly how high class E airspace goes until uh, knowing if you're looking at a chart, what airspace exactly an airport is in, whether you would need uh, ATC permission to fly, an, uh, fly a mission there. Just know the ins and outs of charts. Watch as many chart videos as you can going over different practice questions until you're just rock solid. Because if you can get charts and understand charts, you've pretty much already got a guaranteed 10 questions, if not more, I'd say probably closer to 15 questions on the test that you've got correct right off the bat. Uh, they're gonna have you reference the charts in the booklet that they provide just constantly throughout the test. So getting really familiar with that, that'll take a huge load off, um, just being sure that you definitely have the passing grade secured. So like I said, hopefully that was helpful. And uh, if you guys have any questions, definitely drop them in the comments. Uh, help each other out. And uh, like I said before, if you know the answers to the, the questions that I stated before that I wasn't too sure about, definitely let me know what you think the answer is or what you know the answer is. That way, anybody else finding this video can have something that they're comfortable going to uh, and actually get an answer instead of just questions. All right, guys, that's it for me.